how is how are the markets affecting sports teams? Sal, you want to kick it off? I mean, you've you, you've seen uh, you've seen a few market cycles, and you've seen how they've affected valuations. You've seen how they they affect this whole thing. What do you think? Well, I mean, I've never seen the market hotter than this. Um, I've never been busier. We're closing on the sale of a uh, limited part. Sal, they, they may not understand what you do. Um, so you've never been busy, busier. What is it that you do? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the bulk of my business is buy side, sell side M&A. We either sell control or limited partnership stakes in uh, teams in baseball, football, basketball, hockey in North America and European soccer. So we've sold a significant limited partnership stake in an NBA team that should close by the end of the month. Hopefully tomorrow we're closing on the sale of a uh, a significant limited partnership stake in a Major League Baseball team. I have a second large limit, limited partnership stake coming up. Uh, I'm representing a buyer in the Washington National sale, and I was financial advisor on the AC Milan deal in Europe. And there's a bunch of stuff in the pipeline. Uh, asset values are very strong. Uh, demand is very strong. Look. There's scarcity here, right? There are a limited number of these assets. Capitalism is a wonderful thing. It creates many, many billionaires. And when supply is static and demand continues to go up, prices go up. I think it's fairly simple economics that, you know, even I can understand. <laughs> right. All right. Chris, what about you? What are you seeing? You know, like I, you said, it's messy, and I mean, uh, I I, uh, I have a media advisory and investing business, um, so I'm always on the other side of of teams and leagues that are selling media rights. I also have uh, I'm a founder and a um, CEO of a technology company in in the sports betting space, and I would say, like, you know, just in turn from from that vantage point, like, the mess and the chaos actually creates a lot of opportunity. And I think that sports and sports IP, right, when, when Sal talks about, you know, all these uh, M&A opportunities in sports and scarce, scarce assets, and, you know, you just think about these, these businesses, they're, they're not, it's not just a team or a league. I mean, they are a media company, they're a live event company, they're a data company, they're a real estate company, and, those are all at the center of, of the IP, right? So whether you're the New York Yankees, the scarce asset, or the Green Bay Packers, you know, the, these are really valuable businesses that cut across all kinds of business opportunities. Right. And, and Michael, what are you seeing? Kind of hoping that you can tie it all together because you, uh, from where you sit. Well, I have no business, but... From what exactly. I see is you, t you talk about the craziness. Yeah. So while we've been seeing the multiples that public equities trade at gets lower, the multiples that sports teams have been bought uh, and now are being bought at are actually expanding. And we've seen a plethora of deals recently, right? We saw the Broncos. Uh, we saw AC Milan. We saw Chelsea, two of the big-name soccer teams. So Chelsea was a little bit of a, uh, a special situation, though, right? I mean, well, that's it a was, fire sale. But even more impressive because it was a force yeah. sale, and it still went for a high multiple. So we've seen multiples of revenue where it was maybe four to five going for a number of years, now going from like, you know, six to eight, nine times. And I think that's, this is largely based on the fact that the revenue growth expectations in the future, things like media rights being driven by things like uh, sports betting, uh, incremental revenue coming from the streaming of live content is going to be something that's going to help revenue grow. And as these guys already hit on, there's a limited supply of teams. Yeah. There's only so much you can do with Major League Lacrosse, <laughs> right? <laughs> But Sal, you, you know, when we were talking in, in preparation for this panel, you talked a little bit about um, your experience during the last recession. I mean, what, what happened then? Look, this is an incredibly resilient as asset class. The worst recession I've ever seen was, you know, the Great Recession, okay? Yeah. I'm old and in dirt, but I'm not old enough to remember the Depression, okay? But during that time frame, I was hired six weeks before Bear Stearns got into distress. 
by the Ricketts family to buy the Cubs. It took us almost three years from the day they hired us to the day we closed. The world was a mess. Bear Stearns almost went bankrupt. AIG should have gone bankrupt. Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. The world banking system was on the verge of collapse. And the Tribune companies, which owned the Cubs, filed for bankruptcy in the middle of the sale. And so we had to buy the Cubs in a 363 sale, in a prepackaged bankruptcy, to get rid of the $13.5 billion of liabilities that the Tribune companies had, right? Despite that, we paid the highest price ever up to that point for a Major League Baseball team, okay? We didn't do that because we were stupid. I may be, but not in that instance. It's because we had three other bidders nipping at our heels during a terrible economic period. Now, you could say the Cubs are an anomaly. There were seven control sales during the what's called the Great Recession. Seven, okay? Six of them met or exceeded Mike's valuations. Three of them were record prices. The only one that wasn't was the Pittsburgh Steelers sale, which wasn't a arm's length transaction. It was one of the brothers buying in the other brothers. And in that transaction, I had a bidder, all cash, that would have made it the highest price ever paid for a National Football League team. Think about that. What other asset class can you say that about? None. And I mean, you couldn't get financing. We, the banks weren't lending. And yet, despite that, asset values were incredibly robust and nothing sold at a discount. Nothing. So this sounds like a great investment. I spent a lot of time uh, over the last couple of years putting together funds to invest in teams. Some of the leagues have changed their ownership criteria and made this possible. Um, basically have some, some funds that are almost assembly lines for, for capital into these investments. Does the introduction of funds, uh, you know, smart money we like to call ourselves, um, how does that change uh, valuations? Well, look, they can't buy control stakes. Okay, so in Major League Baseball, for instance, a single fund can invest up to 15% in a team. Total funds can invest 30%. I think in the NBA, it's 20%. In the NFL, they can't invest at all. So they're limited in what they can do. But what they do is they're additional source of capital. They're going to drive price up. I mean, if you have more bidders, what happens, right? You have a limited number of assets. You have more bidders, again. Basic laws of economics, prices are going to go, continue to go up unless something fundamentally changes, which I'm not smart enough to see. So, I mean, what, uh, what took my breath away is that what Sal is saying is that we're the dumb money, right? <laughs> I, mean, it, 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 I, think, I think what's happened is what a lot of this fund money has done in, as LPs, even though they have no say in how the team is run, if they get tag-along rights, they're looking at a return in the long run because they're saying, look at the long-term appreciation of the team. We're not gonna get any dividends. And chances are, certainly because of salary caps, we may not have a lot of, you know, COVID aside, capital calls. We're gonna get a pretty high guaranteed rate of return if we have these tag-along rights when eventually the controlling owner sells. Yeah, and I, it, you know, I think it is one of those things that happens when you take an illiquid asset like LP interest and, and teams used to be really fundamentally illiquid. You have to go find buyers and you create a marketplace for it. What happens? Well, something that was formerly illiquid that becomes liquid will increase in price because you know you've got some kind of exit on the other side. And maybe it's to another one of the funds. Look, I make a living yeah. finding yeah. limited partners want to get out. Why? They get divorced. They, they want to do estate planning. People die. Keep going, okay? I never have trouble finding a buyer. I mean, it's hard work. We have a huge database. I've been doing this for 30 years, so it gives me a competitive advantage. But, you know, we sell limited partnership stakes in a team, and two people win, and 13 bidders lose. Guess what? They go into my database the next time there's availability, guess, guess where I go. Yeah. Chris, you got anything to add on that? Well, yeah, I see, and, and Sal, you know, we're, we've often 
uh, either been on the other side of the table yeah. or on the same side. A lot of, of, of what sort of transpired over the last you know, 15 years, going all the way back to, you know, even when the Yes Network started in 2001, so that's 20 years ago, right? Yeah. That was kind of the beginning of, of, of teams now trying to have their team-owned media vehicles, which is what was unlocking a lot of the asset value, right? And, and there was a time, and maybe even still, that the media companies were more valuable than the teams because of the value of the media rights. And so that, you know, that trend has, has only accelerated over time. And you know, we, we were talking about this the other day, I think on, when we were on our prep call about you know, the, what, as it related to the MLS uh, Apple deal, which you know, is, is continuing along the trend uh, you know, and every you know, content now is moving out of what I describe as kind of the old wholesale model, right, where, you, where you're a rights holder, you sell to a middleman like ESPN or Fox, and then they sell to the retailers, right? And then, so that, the wholesale economics, right, are, has been a really good business for a long time, but going back to 2015-ish, when, when Iger came out and said, uh, you know, we had our first sub-loss on ESPN, you know, it's only degraded, you know, I think about 30% of the bundle now has shrunk, and, and all the while, you have the retail business has started, right, which is the direct-to-consumer business, which allows the IP holder to have a much, uh, much more direct uh, relationship with the end customer, where you can sell he or she all kinds of other stuff. Like, that whole transition right now just, I think, was really crystallized with this new 10-year Apple MLS deal. So I think you're going to continue to see more and more of that, and that, that really is at the center of how these assets are valued as a, you know, in an M&A transaction. C can we talk about that deal a little bit, though? Because, you know, look, I've, I, I'm primarily involved in you know, relatively small LP st sales in the States, and the firm is involved in, in a representation of European soccer clubs and, and purchasing and selling those clubs. Um, you know, but I've also been following M MLS's media rights for a long time, and the deal, from my perspective, resembles their deals with ESPN where they had to pay for coverage um, and basically pay production costs uh, in, in the early 2000s when the league was contracting. Um, and, you know, although there's a big number on it, uh, you know, is, is it really a better deal uh, or, you know, I mean, is this really a, a replacement for those big media deals that the, uh, the leagues and the teams used to have? You guys want to go I'm first? Okay. I'm, I'm okay. probably the contrarian here, but go, let no, these go guys ahead. go. <laughs> no, I want to hear what you have to say. Well, I think that, you know, first of all, it is uh, very creative, right? They, you know, if you had to re-architect how you were going to go to the market with your intellectual property rights, you do a lot of the things that MLS did, right? You, you, you synced up global rights, media rights, data rights, local rights, betting rights, Interact, all, all of that, right? And then you, you know, they they decided to um, marry, you know, the the most valuable company in the world, right? In in Apple, what's a two and a half trillion dollar company that um, knows how to market? They know how to sell service. I mean, they have what an eighty or ninety billion dollar a year services business, right? That knows how to create customer relationships and and has proven to be you know, very elegant in terms of how they make it easier for I mean, uh, the, the previous panel talking about all of the friction and how do you get new customers and you know, I gotta sign up for this app and like, you know, Apple will be, uh, I think, a fantastic marketing partner. And you know, they've, they've created a, a platform that will allow them to build off of knowing that they're sort of, they, they capped some of their downside. And so, in terms of whether the deal is good or not, it's, it's way too early to tell. I mean, they're gonna have to go out now and, and execute, right? So they've got their digital distribution in place now for the next 10 years. They got a great marketing partner. Um, I'm sure like here in the US market, right, they'll, they'll have to find some additional reach, right? So they'll be talking to the more traditional media companies like ESPN and Fox about putting games on that'll access the, at least make it available to the casual fan. That'll all be, you know, each territory around the world, you know, their soccer, that's the one thing about soccer, it, it, it's, a, it's a global market, right? So if they do it right, the, the value of their media rights will be far more valuable for MLS outside the U.S. than they are inside the U.S. And so they're, they're fishing in a very big pond. 
they probably, you know, they, they're going to need to figure out a way over time, right? I, I want to see, I want to see Ronaldo and Messi playing here when they're 25, not when they're 35, right? So they're going to have to, along the way, kind of loosen how they bring, uh, you know, international talent over here because they're in a global talent pool. So I think, you know, I think the punchline here is I think it's a very creative deal. Um, I give them a lot of credit for uh, aligning with with Apple, and now you know now it's going to come down to the next several years about how they execute on it, and you know we'll see. Right. Yeah. Look, I I, I don't think you're a contrarian at all. I mean, I think that's the way I view it too. And and MLS is a little bit of an anomaly because it's not a fully formed league yet. They're one of the few leagues that is continuing to expand. So. It's, it's not as established as the other leagues, but look, what other content is like this content? As technology continues to improve and people are able to edit out their, their commercials and watch the shows anytime they want, the only thing people watch live is sports. What other content is there that, that you know if you're an advertiser, you're gonna have live eyeballs watching that? And it doesn't matter how it's distributed. As long as you're paid for your rights, you don't really care, right? No, I, I think that's right. I mean, I, and what I was saying earlier, you know, MLS is arguably, you know, depending on how, who the soccer experts are in here, um, somewhere around eight, nine, tenth most valuable league in the world. And I think that again goes back to, you know, the investment, you know, in, the, in, the, in player resources. But, but ultimately, you're right. I mean, Live sports is cutting through all the other clutter. They have large, passionate followings. And you know, what, what's going to be interesting is I, I want to see, you know, you saw what's happened recently to Netflix, right? So Netflix was a $250 billion market cap that's now a quarter of the size they were, you know, six months ago. And, you know, the one thing that, you know, they, they're great with long tail, new content, it's all sort of... Um, now they're getting into advertising, which maybe is a little peek into, you know, who's driving the value in advertising these days. Lot, live event programming, live sports is, the, the, you know, that's a, that's a really big piece of how you monetize, you know, live content. I think. So the, the importance of sports as we, we shift from the wholesale model to the retail model is, can't be discounted. In fact, I think that's why I'm very bullish on sports rights continuing to accrete in value, I think there will be some stratification of must-have content versus nice-to-have, right? So it's just, you gotta figure out which, which bucket you're in, but the, the must-have stuff is, is going to, in my view, accelerate in value as we go from the wholesale on a global basis to the, you know, the direct-to-consumer model. It's also the stickiest content in the world. A whole bunch of academic studies have been done if you're nine years old and you're wearing the hat of your favorite team, you're more likely to change your religion than to change your team affiliation. What other product can you say that about? I mean, there, there, there's none, right? I, I mean, I'm a Yankee fan. I don't care if the Mets win the World Series the next 37 years in a row. I want to be a Yankee fan. It is what it is. Michael, you want to jump in there? Yeah, I... Are you a Yankee every, fan as well? <laughs> yeah. 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 So maybe yeah, you're the but, contrarian now. Go ahead. Yeah, you need a contrarian. Go ahead, be the contrarian. These guys don't know anything. They only do this for a living. So <laughs> as, as somebody who doesn't, I I think that the Apple MLS deal was everything that Chris described it. I do also believe on the revenue side, it's more of a joint venture, and I think that MLS is gonna is getting a lot less revenue from this deal because than they expected. And that they even touted, their commissioner touted a couple of years ago. Because they're also paying a lot of the production costs. And they've also foregone their local rights to get this deal. And on top of all of that, it's behind a paywall. So, you know, for me, the bigger picture uh, is when you compare it to the other leagues. And what the sort of story for me is, as somebody who takes a you know, look at valuing sports teams is, the Indian Premier League, which is the most valuable cricket league in the world, just recently signed a new media deal, where combined for streaming 
and linear programming, which was about 50-50, was like a billion dollars a year. So the message is, look, you want the biggest sport in that market, and as it's going to play out, it's still going to be NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, NHL. And I think M there are a lot of MLS owners saying, you know, I think at this point, we thought we'd be getting more guaranteed money. But to be fair, as Chris said, it'll take a while, and we won't really know till the next team is sold. And then, based on the free market transaction, we'll get a good idea of what the market thinks of this deal. Yeah, and I think Mike, you know, hit on an important point. I mean, part of the, 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 the you know, the, the look back now on how, where the deal landed was, you know, sort of what was reported out there a year or so ago in terms of, like, revenue targets. And it is fair to say that there were some much higher numbers than the 250 a year. So there's, a, I, I think, a little bit of criticism about that. But, you know, I go back to, like, Apple has, you know, a, a, a billion, eight, two billion device, like, the installed base on Apple, right, is massive and you know it's single sign-on this stuff is going to be available everywhere with a flick of the the switch now how they monetize it and market it and what they put in there and you know they have some creative things in there like um and, and mls I, and, you know they're a, a live event league so they you know their attendance is very strong right so if you're a season ticket holder right you have automatic access as a part of your season ticket package to all the media offerings, to every single game in the league every year globally. So that's like, that, you know, those kinds of things in terms of like how Apple is going to market this and what else they might do with, on top of that with the more traditional media companies. Because I think that's really what happened when, when the auction started, right? And whenever it was a year and a half, two years ago, you know, early, you know, their current partners, right, are Fox and ESPN and you know, their, their linear businesses, right, are, are in transition, right? They're, they're moving from that wholesale model to the ESPN Plus now is in 22 million, not 22 million subscribers three years ago, they had zero, right? So they're trying to, to melt down the iceberg because it's paying for all the rights that they're buying to put on to ESPN Plus now. And that, that whole transition is going to take a whole cycle. So you're still looking at another five to ten years. That's why that term of ten years is interesting, right? Because all this stuff is going to happen over that period of time. And then I think the best judgment of this deal will be to see how it set them up for the next deal and, and what happens to franchise valuations in between now and then. Well, I think the next deal to the pattern you just laid out could be they buy Sunday ticket from the NFL. Oh, yes, yes. And then they'll have Major League Baseball, Major League Soccer, and yeah. a big piece of the NFL. And that'll be very interesting. Look, and, and there are other things driving valuations here. Gambling is just starting to be legalized, right? And when it was in the United Kingdom, what happened? Let's see. People watch games longer because if you're watching a baseball game and your team's losing 14 nothing in the seventh inning, you're going to turn it off unless you've bet a couple hundred bucks on what the second hitter in the eighth inning is going to do, right? You're also going to watch games that you have no rooting interest in. So, and gambling is coming, and it's, it's a huge business, and it's going to be a huge generator in terms of eyeballs watching these games. It's going to push up the media rights value. Yeah, look, you, you only need to look at your March Madness bracket to know whether uh, it, you know, even a small investment causes you to change your viewing behavior. So it's, it's hugely different. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and Chris, you've got kind of a, a bird's eye view on on integrating gambling into, into some of these other uh, uh, other revenues. Yeah, so I, I mentioned earlier, uh, I have uh, my other company, uh, Simple Bets, technology company. We're actually about five blocks away. Um, and we've, we've invested about $80 million, uh, heavy machine learning, machine, engine, machine learning, data science, automation around in-play micro-betting. And we've been at it for about four years now. And, you know, what I'm seeing now, I mean, you're 100% you're right, like Sal said, the, I mean, study after study after study, we'll see, you know, anybody that has uh, any kind of money on a game, right, is more, is like 97% more likely to watch longer. And that goes back to, you know, like, how the leagues and teams actually 
get the majority of their revenue is through media deals. So, you know, there's a, we've invested in a product that's called micro betting, in-play betting. We basically have created a technology that um, allows for in-play betting where you don't have to wait the entirety of the game to know the results. So in other words, every single pitch, every single at bat, every single play in an NFL game, or every single drive, every shot, every possession in an NBA game. And you know, we've seen the product out there now for about a year and it's driving massive engagement. And this is like just version one of this. I mean, we've, we've essentially taken two and three hour football, baseball and basketball games and turned them into hundreds of thousands of mini games. It's like turning live sports into a slot machine. And that kind of velocity that goes through it, and it's, and it's, a, it's a more engaging product, right? Because it's actually something that like a casual fan, you know, like you were talking about earlier about trading and um, you know, the earlier panel here. Uh, and it's not like an in, in, in play and micro betting, which is, a, which is a super duper engagement tool that you could be a punter or I mean a, a, an avid better and shop around for the best lines. That's not why you're doing this. This is like how a casual fan watches it. Yeah, I think, I'm a Yankee fan too. I think, you, you know, know some of the- You're a person of good taste and high intelligence. <laughs> uh, so when I watch a game and I sit on the couch with my son, I say, oh, Garrett Cole's gonna, this is gonna be a fastball for more than 95 miles per hour. I'm betting that right now. Bet $5 to win $7.99. Like that's what happens, right? So that's how you watch a game or I say I'm a Giants fan I admitted it. I'm a New York Giants fan. Saquon's going to run for 10 yards or more on this play. Or, you know, Daniel Jones is going to throw to Sterling Shepard for a touchdown. And then you get into the micro parlays. Like, okay, I think Aaron Judge is going to hit the fourth pitch to right field for a home run. Then you start talking about more like lottery type product. Like, that's really fun, engaging stuff to... To, to drive attention, I mean, that's ultimately what the media companies want. They want just people watching their games longer, and that's what they're paying for. I mean, frankly, it's how we already watch sports. It's uh, just, yeah. now there's gonna be somebody that actually yeah. makes sure you pay up. Yeah. 100%, and right. it's like, yeah. you know, what we're really, you know, he's talking about the, the movement from wholesale to retail. What, we, what we're really in the middle of is just the personalization of media. And that's really what data rights and all these interactivity rights, like sports betting, it's, you're moving from a world where it was a mass media opportunity into a one-on-one -on -one media relationship, but there's all these other things you can do around it, and it can get very personalized. Right. Michael, do you have any re response to that kind of from a, from a media perspective about the... I, I totally identify with what Chris is saying, and it was something that was pointed out to me about seven, eight years ago when the Sacramento Kings of the NBA were bought by uh, Vivek Ranadive, who's a real quant, soft-spoken, but brilliant guy. And so I went out to interview him, and uh, at that time, I'm sure Sal remembers the exact price, but it was like 540 million? 535. 535. I sold, it to, I sold it to him, Mike. But it was thought to be a very high price. So anyway, at the end of the interview, I said, how much do you think this team will be worth like in five years? And he said, billions. So I said, excuse me, because he's very soft-spoken. So I said, can you say that again? This is, I want this on film. He said, billions. But he said, Michael, he said, when you do your valuations, he says, you're thinking about it the wrong way. He said, you're looking at this as a spreadsheet with a team with revenue, EBITDA, you know, net income. He says, what it is is exactly what Chris just described. He said, it's a brand with millions of devout followers who want real information on tons of in things in real time, and they want to be able to connect with each other. So I think the bottom line of it is, and, and, and what this means for team values as an investment is, you, these teams are still brand names that are up here based on their followings and their international reach, and their revenues down here. And the idea is to get revenue closer to the brand value. Sal, you wanna jump in? No, look. There's gonna be a bifurcation, all right? Values are going up. But if you have the New York Yankees, guess what? If you put the New York Yankees on the market at an auction, I don't even know what the hell the price would be, okay? Some of the lower brands, bottom quartile in each league are much more difficult to sell. 
but there are buyers for those brands. All of the things we talked about continue to drive valuation. So they may, their revenue multiples may go up at a lower rate, but they're still going up. And this is a very unique asset class. There's, there's nothing else I can think of that's exactly like this. One of the things I love about baseball is it's 162 games. Gambling, you have a lot more games to gamble on. You have a lot more specific events to gamble on. And immigration patterns in the United States are, are a great tailwind for baseball. I don't know why baseball doesn't talk about this, but they don't. Every 25 years or so, immigration patterns in the United States change. When I came here, most of the immigrants that came to the United States were from Southern Europe and Eastern Europe. Then it shifted to South Asia and East Asia. Now the bulk of the immigrant population comes from Central America, Mexico, the Caribbean Basin, Venezuela. Guess what? Those people love baseball. They already have stars from their countries playing baseball. And they don't have to learn English like I did to follow baseball. You hit the SAP button, you can follow. Okay? And they know the brands already. They, they have their favorite teams. This is going to be a huge tailwind for baseball for a while. And baseball's finding ways to, to better market. But I just think the upside is, is huge here across the board in sports. Well, let, let's talk about that a little bit more because, you know, 70 years ago, the biggest sports in the United States were football, horse racing, and boxing. No, of those wait, three. wait, wait, no, no, no. I'm going to correct you. In the 1930s, the three biggest sports in the United States were baseball, boxing, and horse racing, not football. Football did not become popular in the I United mean, States as a until college they accidentally sport. put it on a nationally televised game in 1958. Okay. And it was what people call the greatest game ever played. And football started to take off. Before that, professional football... It was college football that was popular. Nobody watched the NFL. And then if you remember, in the early 60s, the NFL was on the verge of bankruptcy. People forget that. Um, so it's a relatively, when you're as old as I am, the 60s are <laughs> relatively recent. The rest of you, it's not. But it's relatively recent. But the part of that that I wanted to focus on, point taken, thank you, um, is that horse racing and boxing no longer have kind of that broader cultural reach. Yeah. Um, what are the downside risks for sports teams? Are there any, I mean, you know, it, it's presented here as a juggernaut. I see it. I, I see the valuation. Horse racing and boxing are not team sports. A horse has a brand for a very short period of time. Secretariat was one of the greatest athletes I've ever seen. But his competitive period was one year, basically, right? Teams build brands over decades. Look. I'm a Knicks fan because I grew up with the early Knicks teams that were great. And I will always be a Knicks fan. Nobody follows an individual athlete, which is what a jockey would be or a boxer would be, for that period of time. There are anomalies. Muhammad Ali was the greatest of all time, and I'm a huge fan of his. But, you know, he's one person, and his career is limited. Brands continue. And that's why I think that there's a huge upside still to be seen here. But I don't know. Maybe I'm in the minority. Yeah, and I'd, I'd say, just to tack on to that, um, I, I think you're, you're correct about that, Sal. But the, when I trace back, boxing is a good example, right? You know, when, when they decided to move off of what was called then network television, right? Whatever this was, 35, 40 years ago. And go into the pay-per-view business, right? You know, that's where boxing culturally fell way, way behind. And they're still playing catch up to, to some degree. But in those days, in order to watch like a, you know, a pay-per-view, you, you had to like drive to a movie theater or go, go somewhere, right? Where, so they, they shrunk their audience, the reach, right, platforms. They basically just disappeared, uh, at, you know, out of, out of uh, you know, our, our culture. And, and, and you really had to be like a hardcore boxing fanatic to want to go do that. And so, you know, now it, it'd be interesting because we were just talking about Apple and MLS yeah. earlier. It's, it's kind of similar, but it's not really because Apple's in two billion people's hands and it, it, with the flip of the switch, that content is there. So it's much less 
friction. And I think that's a really good example, like why, in my view, like that's where boxing went way down. I mean, there were still the, you know, the big prize fights that, you know, a couple of fighters would, would make, you know, good money, but the whole rest of the ecosystem suffered. Yeah. As, as the non-professional and least knowledgeable person on this panel, I got to play the contrarian again. I think if we change the name of boxing to fighting, fighting is a much bigger industry than it was. What happened with boxing was that you grew into a lot of different divisions. You know, they call it alphabet soup, right? WBC, WBA, da da. But you also got mixed martial arts. Right. So fighting as an industry, as a sport, has grown exponentially over the last, you know, several years. We don't know, as you're saying, you know, the name of the title holders, are, but it's, it's, it's grown enormously, and a lot of it because of, you know, the way it's presented. Yeah, you're talking about MMA, you mean. Yeah. Like, yeah. So, uh, and I, I, I come from the wrestling world. I was a college wrestler. I went to Penn State, and I follow it from the wrestling standpoint because most of the, the top fighters in MMA if you go through the weight classes. They're mostly college wrestlers because it rewards grappling and submission holds. So I trace it back to you know when when Endeavor right and and Dana White decided to get married. You know this is however many years ago right. And they put real professional marketing distribution and you know Endeavor bought uh, whatever. I mean I think it was a four billion dollar deal even back yeah. then. And you know they turned it into a global sport and you know like it has you know, gone beyond just fighting because, you, you know, you have boxers in there that turn and they learn all the other skills and they've, you know, they've sort of like accelerated past just boxing as an industry, right? So, and I think they've done that by, by virtue of essentially the media rights business. <laughs> right. Well, unfortunately, we are running out of time. I wish that we could talk a little bit more about some of the individual rights and the way that that is going to affect things. But uh, you know, I'm glad that you, you managed to work in submission holds. Um, <laughs> Um, Take it backstage. Any right? any any last thoughts about where this is going? I mean, I think I think it's pretty clear uh, in in the view of the panel. But I'd like to hear any last thoughts you have. It's going up, and yeah. it's going to go up at a faster rate for bigger sport, the bigger leagues like the NFL and the NBA. As Sal mentioned, there's a bifurcation, and the reason why I always agree with Chris, you'll notice, is because he knows those holds. <laughs> Look, I'm very good at predicting the past. I'm not real good at predicting the future, but all indications are to me that valuation is going to continue to go up, and the number of people interested in this business is growing exponentially, and the number of teams is. Yeah, and I, um, I mean, I think we we covered it, most of this. I mean, the the future is bright. You know, high value live sports rights, um, which which are the you know really the main the main asset that's driving all these uh, team M&A deals, but even beyond that, just the, the value of content in a global marketplace when, and peop the, with, a, with you know, two or three billion people that today are connected, right, with high-speed access throughout the world, like where you can get content very quickly and very easily. I mean, I think the, you know, if you have, if you're in that must-have um, bucket of valuable sports rights, you know, it's a great place to be. Right. All right. Well, thank you very much. You guys all have a tremendous amount of experience and, uh, and knowledge on this. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you.